to some breaking news. Right now, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is providing an update on the death of Ahmad Arbery. Last night, the GBI arrested William Roddy Bryan Jr. He's now the third suspect in this case. Brian, the man who filmed Arbery's death and the two other suspects are now all charged with murder. Well, we go now to the GBI headquarters in Decatur for a live update on the case. The arrest of uh, William Bryan in Glenn County, Georgia. He was charged with the offenses of felony murder and criminal attempt to commit the felony offense of false imprisonment. The defendant was arrested around 5.30, 5.35 yesterday evening in Glenn County without incident was turned over to the Glenn County Sheriff's Department and was booked into that local jail. I just wanted to take a moment this morning and to thank some of our partners in this case who have assisted us to this point of the investigation. Of course, the Glenn County Sheriff's Department for their assistance yesterday along with the Georgia State Patrol and the FBI. I also want to take a moment on behalf of the Bureau to thank uh, the Cobb District Attorney's Office and Ms. Holmes to my left for their involvement and assistance throughout the course of this investigation once they became involved. I want to take a moment as well on a little bit more of a personal note and thank the uh, Arbery family for their patience and thank the city of Brunswick and Glenn County and the state of Georgia and the citizens here for their patience as well. As most of you will recall uh, who have been following this case, the GBI was requested to become involved. I think today is our 16th day of the investigation. When we first became involved, we uh, uh, respectfully uh, requested the citizens of Brunswick, Glenn County, and the state of Georgia, and to some extent this country, to grant us some patience to allow us to conduct the investigation. Uh, that's been done, and, and I want to tell you on behalf of this Bureau, we sincerely appreciate that. It wasn't an easy thing to ask. When we became involved, we knew the case was already over two months old. Uh, it was not that way to this Bureau because uh, May 6th was our first day of hitting the ground running, investigating the case, but we certainly realized it was a case that had been around a while. It was a case that has generated a great deal of emotion and passion, and we respect that. And so I, I cannot begin to tell you from, from the bottom of our heart uh, as an agency how much we appreciate uh, the city, the county, the state, and to, to some extent this country granting this agency the, the ability and the patience to do our job. Also, if you will indulge me just a moment, I want to thank the agents of the GBI for uh, their disciplined, methodical approach in this case. Uh, I'm very proud of the agents who've worked virtually nonstop uh, since uh, the morning of May 6th in conducting this investigation. As I said a moment ago, this is our 16th day of conducting the investigation. I'm very proud of the agents who I work with day in and day out. Uh, as I told you back uh, when I stood before you two weeks ago today, we intended on turning over every stone in this case. Uh, the agents have, have, have done that, and I'm very, very proud of the work they're doing, and I appreciate them. Procedurally, what will happen at this point, we have a few more things to do in the course of the investigation. I'm not sure how long it will take us to do those, but it should be a relatively short period of time. Once we do that and we have the investigation buttoned down, we will turn that file over to Ms. Holmes and her staff, I'll let her speak in a moment procedurally what, what would be the next step for them. After she gets through speaking, I'll certainly make myself available to answer questions. I do want to give you a general reminder that uh, this is an active, ongoing murder investigation. Uh, I cannot and will not speak factually about the case. I can't. This case eventually is going to be tried in a court of law. It cannot be tried out here in the open. It has to be tried in the, in the sterile environment of a courtroom, and so I respect that and appreciate that questions about procedure, process, things of that nature, I will do everything I can to answer those questions, but I did want to just give you that reminder that uh, I'm restricted from addressing the facts of the case. Those will come out in a court of law. So again, thank you for your time this morning. I'll have Ms. Holmes speak, and then I'll make myself available for any questions. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joyette Holmes, the District Attorney for the Cobb Judicial Circuit. Our office will be handling the prosecution of the case against those who are charged in the murder of Ahmad Aubrey. We have been um, grateful for the confidence that the Attorney General Chris Carr has put in our office to handle this case, as we've said before in our previous statements, that we are going to make sure that we find justice in this case. We know that we have a broken family and a broken community down in Brunswick. 
Now, I do ask, I know that there are a lot of people who have questions about next steps, about the facts, about where we go from here. But we ask that you allow us to try those things in the courtroom uh, for the sanctity of this case and just making sure that we are able to do what we as prosecutors are called to do as ministers of justice. The GBI has been great in the 10 days that our office has been assigned to this case in letting us have input and have discussions about where this case moves. They have been a wonderful partner uh, to us in doing that. Um, the Aubrey family has certainly been grateful for the interest in this case, but again, as questions continue to come up, we prefer that we handle those in the courtrooms and in those next steps. I thank you so much. I have today with me my Chief Investigator Charles Prescott to my, to my left, excuse me, your right, as well as the Deputy Chief Investigator uh, Richard Randolph, and they have been working with the agents in the Georgia Bureau of Investigations to get to this point. So thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity, Director Reynolds, to be here this morning to address some of those and just to let everyone know that the confidence that I have in the office of the District Attorney in Cobb County and the team that we have assembled to prosecute this case. Thank you. Uh, we'll try our best to address some questions. If you have, I know you have a few this morning. Uh, if you'll allow me, I'll just start over here and work my way left to right. Yes, ma'am. armed at the time of the incident. Yeah. Again, I'm not going to speak about the facts of the case. Of, I think the warrants speak for themselves as to what we believe happened and what he was charged. I'm not being disrespectful, I'm just not comfortable speaking on that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is what, what the status is regarding the investigation that we've been asked to do uh, uh, about potential prosecutorial misconduct. As you recall, we were asked by the Attorney General's office to conduct a separate and distinct investigation into that. The Bureau is doing that. I, I don't have a timeline on that, but I do anticipate it's not going to take us much longer to finish it. Once that's completed, what will procedurally happen is we will turn that file over to the Attorney General's office. They will be the deciding agency or entity in what, if anything, happens in that regard. Our agents, uh, a separate team of agents, are conducting that investigation. And again, I don't have a definitive timeline, but I can. I am comfortable in telling you that I don't anticipate it will be much longer until we're through with that one as well. Yes, David. Are you able to tell us what was the You know, I don't know if there was a proverbial last straw. I will tell you that in, in the conducting an investigation, what, what I would ask folks to remember is that we don't go into a situation of, of this nature investigating a person or persons. We go in investigating a set of facts. And once we start turning stones over, sometimes there's one or two stones underneath there that need to be turned over. And once we reached a point, and it was probably sometime Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, when we uh, began speaking with our folks there, that we'd reached the point uh, in conjunction with the Cobb District Attorney's Office that we were convinced probable cause existed to make those charges. We proceeded to do that yesterday. It wasn't a proverbial last uh, 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 a moment of epiphany or anything of that nature. It was just an accumulation of various things that were there and various things we discovered over the last 16 days. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Bryan contingently said he was nothing more than a witness that did not know that they were you all able to determine that Mr. Bryan did know the McMichaels through any set of texts or conversations? Can you speak to how you determine those I will, I will say this, again, not to speak on the facts. They'll come out in a court of law. But I can tell you that if we believed he was a witness, we wouldn't have arrested him. You know, so there's probable cause, and we're comfortable with that. Yes, sir. Mr. Bryan, has he provided any additional footage from that cell phone? In other words, which are more than the 36 seconds of the public uh, we have accumulated a number of pieces of video in the case. I'm not going to speak specifically about what we took from him, uh, uh, but uh, eventually that will come out in a court of law. But suffice it to say there are a number of pieces of video that helped us get to this point. Yes, sir. Is there anything you can say to reports that Brian was using his truck to block? I, would, uh, I won't speak to that specifically. I would refer you to the warrant, particularly on the one on false imprisonment. I think it speaks for itself. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate more on the reported Facebook posts of neighbors in the community saying that they were going to be looking out to potentially send a message to people coming into their neighborhood. 
Uh, I'm not comfortable speaking of that now. I will tell you that we've looked, we've, our agents have looked over a ton of social media posts, and the majority of those will be made part of this file, which will be turned over to the district attorney's office. In any investigation, particularly one of this nature, where we've charged three people, there's a great accumulation of pieces of evidence that eventually go into the deciding factors. Again, I'm, I'm not being flippant or being disrespectful to your question. I just I don't want to get any more into it than that. Yes, ma'am. I, I, at this point, I don't anticipate that. I will tell you that, um, uh, as I said a moment ago, we're, we're finishing up the, the investigation into the murder. Again, there's no timeline. I don't anticipate us being, uh, being uh, doing much more in, in, into the case before we button it up and give it to the district attorney's office. But I will tell you this, as I said uh, back on uh, two weeks ago today in Brunswick, that we go wherever the facts take us. and. You know, if the facts took us in another direction or to another person, we would go there. Right now, I do not anticipate that happening. Okay. Yeah, Angelique. Um, I was going to ask you about Mr. Bryan. Without going into the investigation, was he the first person that contacted police about the shooting? I, I don't want to say that. I don't want to answer that question yet. I will tell you um, that... Um, that his, uh, I think the, the warrants again indicate what we believe and are confident his involvement was as far as when he in, may have contacted the police or if he was the one who contacted the police. Uh, I'm sure the COD DA's office will introduce that in evidence at the appropriate time. Yes, sir. Reynolds, I was yes. wondering if you can put on your former prosecutor hat on for a moment and put in perspective for folks. We know that uh, Brian did not pull the trigger, so why would someone like him in these circumstances? Be charged with murder? Well, I, I certainly think that's a fair question. I understand people's concern or curiosity about that, but I, I, again, I would point you to what the warrants indicate. Felony murder is a crime in Georgia where uh, if, you can, if you are committing a felony crime and that crime ends up in the death of another human being, then that's a felony murder. And so, uh, as the warrants indicated, he's charged with an underlying felony. He's also charged with felony murder, so uh, we believe the evidence would indicate that his underlying felony helped cause the death of Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, it'll be the cop district attorney's job, their responsibility, which they take on to prove that in a court of law. But they've been involved with us in the decision making of this particular arrest. I think they're as confident as we out we are they'll be able to prove that up in the court of law when that day comes. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Earls, thank you. There was a text message that was sent from a police officer to a property owner essentially urging him to contact Mr. McMichael if there were concerns about trespassers on his property. Is that police officer or are any police officers under investigation? You know, I, I don't want to speak on that directly. I will tell you that things that, uh, 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 that are relevant to this murder case we've looked at and are continuing to look at, if they're relevant to the murder case, what I would ask people to remember is that sometimes things happen in a case where perhaps acts are foolish, where perhaps acts are something that societally speaking we frown upon. Doesn't mean they're criminal. You know, we have to be able to differentiate, uh, uh, as my father uh, often told me, differences in criminal acts and difference between acts of people who have their head stuck up their area. And so there's a difference. And so, uh, uh, and, and to answer your question, the, if the investigation leads to other folks, you know, those charges will be filed. If they don't, they won't. And to be clear, are you I'm not ruling that out, but I will tell you at this point, we feel confident that the individuals who needed to be charged have been charged. Well, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry, sir. On the prosecutorial misconduct investigation, how much are you coordinating with the Department of Justice? Are, is, is double the work being done, or are you all sharing? Scott, are we working with them? Is that a fair statement? Right. Yeah, we're working hand in hand in conjunction with them. Um, uh, the, the federal authorities are, are, have always been great partners with the GBI. They are in this particular case as well. Uh, I, I think it suffice to say it's a, it's a single investigation ran, being ran together. Now, ultimately, there may be different decisions made on a federal level and a state level, but right now we are working hand-in-hand -hand with them. Yes, sir? What would be the uh, crime that, that the investigation would be you know, if you were to recall, what the request that came to the Bureau was to investigate whether or not there was any prosecutorial misconduct. 
whether or not that leads to any criminal situations. Christian, I, I, I can't say at this point. I will tell you that the request was specific as to whether or not uh, look at the conduct of the prosecutors involved on the front end of this case. We are doing that. We're interviewing individuals. We're putting that file together, and it will be turned over to uh, Chris Carr's office in the Attorney General. Question for Ms. Holmes? Yes. Ready, Joe? Ms. Holmes, are you considering a request for venue change for this trial? So it's a little early in the process to discuss the venue change. I anticipate that that will come up, that motions will be filed to that effect. And when it happens, we'll go through the process of getting that done or not. I also have a question for, for you, if you could. Um, have you spoken to the Aubrey family in this process? And what are you saying to them to ensure, to reassure them that this case will be tried fairly? I have spoken to the family. Uh, we started those conversations on the day that our office was appointed to handle this case. We've continued those conversations along with our team. Um, they know and are aware that we have victim advocates in our office that are assigned specifically to their family to help them through the process so that they understand step by step what we are going to be doing. And so most of our conversations have been about that. Um, a request also to help us to get to know Ahmad. So as we go through this process, we can make sure that as the facts and the law come together, that we're doing the right thing by the case. When is the bond hearing and preliminary hearing going to be put in the None have been scheduled as of yet. I do anticipate that counsel for each of the defendants in this case, that they will file a request for that. Are there concerns that uh, because of the allegations of uh, or questions about prosecutorial misconduct, that it might interfere or undermine your prosecution of the case, and what are you trying to do to limit that? So our office is focused on the prosecution of the case and where the facts and the law lead us to make that prosecution. We understand that there are going to be those distractions because people want to add narratives to the case that don't involve the prosecution. but. We're doing the right thing by what we do. Our prosecutorial code of conduct requires that we be ministers of justice and seek that uh, and only that in cases. So while it may be a distraction and people are talking about those things, we're not making that our priority, our primary focus. Can you talk about the transfer of evidence and investigative work to your office? How has that process been, especially since there are allegations of cover up and, and Well, we've had complete confidence in the investigation that the GBI has done in this case. Uh, they have allowed us, certainly since we've been in the case, to talk through what that investigation has yielded thus far. But the discovery process and the full case file, that process is a little bit down the road. Uh, did you have to go back to square one, essentially, given that there were so many issues early on in Glen County? That's probably more of a question for the director in that that investigation started 16 days ago, a little bit before our office was involved. I have a question. Well, following up on that just a little bit, were you, I guess, did, can you talk about the role that your investigators will play in this? Will they be going back? Will they be gathering their own evidence, doing their own interviews? Well, right now they've worked in great collaboration with the agents uh, in the GBI who have been working this case. So right now we're going to continue that. One more question, Aisha, and then we're going to wrap up. Many people have said that they would like to see the two DAs that refuse themselves um, come under investigation. If they were to, would that be your office? No, it would not. Can you recap the, the two assistants' names real quick for me? Behind my you? chief investigator is Charles Prescott, and my deputy chief investigator is Richard Randolph. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm not going to speak on what we found in that. Uh, uh, th that's something, again, factually, that will have to come out in a court of law. I do want to wrap up and say this, and then I'll let you all get to your business. Uh, I, uh, on behalf of the Bureau, I can't begin to tell you how much we appreciate uh, the, the, the interest in this case. I know there's been a great deal. Uh, I will tell you that uh, there's been a lot of questions posed to us, there's been a lot of phone calls made to us, uh, and we appreciate the community's involvement. Uh, the reality is we make our decision based on facts in a case, and, and uh, I, I will stand before you today and tell you that's exactly what we've done in this case. The agents have made arrests based on facts in the case. I'm proud of the fact that they haven't made any arrests based on any type of pressure, any type of social media, any type of phone calls or anything of that nature, and I think that's exactly the way the system works. I hope in the end 
that our involvement in this case, the way we've handled the case, hopefully brings uh, uh, an air of credibility to the criminal justice system, particularly here in our state. I'm very proud of the agents. I'm proud to partner with Ms. Holmes. Thank you for your time this morning, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You just heard a news conference headed up by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation providing an update on the shooting death of Ahmad Arbery. The GBI explained the charges of the third suspect, that's William Roddy Bryan Jr. That's the man reportedly who filmed Arbery's final moments. Now, the third suspect's charges include felony murder. And during the news conference, the GBI explained how this suspect is accused of felony murder, even though he did not pull the trigger. The GBI says this is its 16th day of being involved with this case. And the director of the GBI says it hasn't been easy, but they are making strides. Again, three arrests now in this case. For a full breakdown of this case, you can find it on our website. That's WJCL.com. Also, look for the latest on this case coming up later today, live at 5 on WJCL 22 News. We return you back now to your original program.